My name is Sicham Mutsielwa. I'm from the Speakers Firm. Welcome and thank you for choosing to join the Empower Entrepreneurs Digital Conversations, a COVID-19 discussion hosted by Empowers. A special welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Bonang Mohali. He's the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Free State, Professor of Practice in the Johannesburg Business School, College of Business and Economics and Chairman of the Bidvest Group Limited. He's the author of the best-selling book, Lift As You Rise. We have a broad representation of stakeholders joining us directly via Zoom, and they will post their questions directly on the chat box. There will be a Q&A at the end of the keynote, and we'll respond to as many of the questions as possible. To get a direct invite to the next talk tomorrow, the 12th of May, 2020 by Nigel Arense, CEO of the Enterprise Development Property Fund, an impact fund whose aim is to transform the 5.8 trillion property sector. Please contact the WhatsApp number 082-088-5262 or visit the EmpowerWorks website where you'll also get information around other EmpowerWorks properties like Empower Women, Empower Men, Empower Youth, Speakers Firm, leadership summits and events that they host. We are live on the following EmpowerWorks digital platforms, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and the hashtag that we follow for these conversations is Empower Entrepreneurs. COVID-19 has changed the world. And when context changes, everything changes. How does one see the big picture today? How does one connect the dots to see patterns emerge? What information does one need to complete the picture and see what is really happening? Perhaps we need voices that can help us to frame the problem as is and give some pointers uh, on what can give us hope as a people. I'd like to, hold, to hand over to you, Professor Bonang Mohali, for your keynote. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It's an absolute privilege to have this conversation with you this evening to try and improve the quality of the line. I'm going to concentrate on my voice, not so much on the video because you have seen that I am alive and indeed in the room, if you don't mind. <clears throat> so a million thanks for making time in your busy schedule in the wake of what we are facing these days. For me, there are two spooky past incidents that are worthy of revisiting. The first is the 1988 Japanese science fiction manga, which means a graphic novel called Akira by Japanese artist Katsuhiro Otomo, released on anime film about the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. In the novel, he describes the 147 days countdown before the Olympics and graffiti on the walls simply demanding just cancel it in protest. The second is the 2011 movie titled Contagion about a COVID-19 like virus. It is hard to comprehend that it was on the 31st of December 2019 when the world really woke up to the novel coronavirus 2019, in short, called COVID-19. In just five months, we now have about 4.2 million infected and about 283,868 dead, with about 1.4 million recoveries. South Africa was gifted its very first patient on the 1st of March. And in just two months, we now have 10,015 infected, 194 deaths, with 4,173 recoveries. This already affected logistics, tourism, petrol prices, airlines, textiles, etc., around the world in all 
the 193 countries. With a global population of almost 8 billion people, about half were in lockdown, and some countries are beginning to ease the restrictions, whilst others have seen the inevitable rise in new infections and have been forced to go back to lockdown. There is no doubt that COVID-19 has fundamentally changed everything. Allow me to think with you about just three of these. First, this is how the world will start thinking about the health and well-being of their people in good times in order to build the necessary resilience to cope with the increasing frequency of occurrence and virulence of these successive viruses. Resilience, especially in Africa, is much more than the food, energy, water nexus. You see, health is not just the absence of disease and infirmity. It is the physical, emotional, social, and psychological well-being. The countries of Southeast Asia are demonstrating that they have internalized the learnings extracted from previous viral attacks like SARS, COVID, SARS, COVID-2, MERS COVID, etc., also known as H1N1 epidemics, by rapidly and widely deploying these learnings to good effect. South Korea's learnings have been mostly about speed, intensity, transparency and cooperation. From now on, electorates like you and I are just not going to demand houses, electricity, roads and bridges, but hospitals, good healthcare, water, education and social justice. Gone are the days when leaders neglected provision of good healthcare to their own citizens in the comfort that when they and their nuclear families need healthcare, that they can obtain this overseas at the expense of their own taxpayers. Second is the direct financial impact of those infected and affected, as well as the direct economic devastation as a result of the ubiquitous lockdown at a time of global income disparity and attendant social unrest, extreme weather, and precarious government finances. For example, the price of crude oil has plummeted from the highs of yesteryear at 147 US dollars per barrel to 20 and now 30 US dollars per barrel when no country, no company is breaking even below the 60 to 80 US dollar per barrel band. At these bargain prices, China is frenetically buying to replenish its strategic stockpile. You see, the world GDP is approximately 90 trillion US dollars. Almost 20 trillion dollars is the European GDP, which represents about 23% of the global GDP. This world cannot have a healthy global economy without a healthy European economy. The EU is more important to the global GDP than China because of its maturity of markets and a strong financial system based on hundreds of years of foundations. China lacks both these qualities. In the first three months, we have lost 3.2 trillion US dollars in global GDP. World capital markets have lost double that amount. Apple is facing a revenue loss of 1 billion a day because of its stores closure around the world. Asia airlines alone have recorded a 129 billion US dollar loss. United Airlines is losing 100 billion US dollars a day. United States of America experienced 10 million unemployment claims in one week and 6.6 .6 million of these in just one day, and today stands at 26 million unemployed, representing about 10.4% from only 4% at the beginning of this year. The 100 million barrel a day world crude oil consumption has already dropped to 89 million barrels a day. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia announced that it will increase its daily production from 9.7 million barrels a day 
to 12.8 million barrels a day. John Menzies has been forced to reduce his global workforce by 17,500 jobs as he tries to stay afloat amid this COVID-19 fallout. Here at home, both the 86 years old South African Airways and the 26 year old South African Express Airways are in business rescue. The 77 year old Comair has posted its very first loss since its inception. Without any government assistance, South Africa will have no aviation industry to speak of. South African companies have responded by, amongst others, increasing operational efficiencies, changing product specifications, launching new products, and increasing customer experience, adopting even better technologies, and growing e-commerce by increasing their information and communication technology equipment procurement, by increasing research and development spend, by even selling nine core businesses and consolidating some businesses. The most recent example is MassMarts announced reduction of 15 to seven mega warehouses, demanding reduced rentals for game stores and agitating for an end to big annual increases in rental. Labor market adjustments are now in full swing as evidenced by reductions in employment remuneration, hours worked per employees. In the first six weeks of this year, the announced planned layoffs are much more than 10,000 with Samanco's 3,000, Telcom's 3,000, MassMart's 1,440, ArcelorMittal's 1,400, Sibanyas, 1,142, Glencore's 665, Aspen's 219. The list is long. This excludes SAA, SEX, ESCOM, etc. Temporary Employer Employee Relief Scheme by December 2019 already had 47 applications with about 5,000 affected employees. In the magazine sector, the 38-year-old Associated Media Publishing, the publishing house for Cosmopolitan, House and Ledger, Women and Wills, Good Housekeeping, founded by Jane Raffaelli and Kexton and CTP publishers, who published Bona, Garden and Home, Women and Home, Food and Home, Your Family, People, Country Life, etc., have been forced to close permanently effective from the 1st of May. The third for me is how human behavior, relations and interactions are going to change both at the personal level and at the world of work. This has changed the way we greet, the way we visit, the way we gather, the way we entertain, the way we bury our dead, the way we pray and worship in exactly the same way that it now feels so archaic that we used to write letters, lick a postage stamp, and stick it onto the envelope and walk to the post office to put it into a red bin and then wait for six weeks to be delivered and still wait another six weeks for a reply. Our children find it quite funny that we use telegrams, telex machines, faxes, photocopiers, etc. Our grandchildren, will laugh when they learn that we used to book our flights a year in advance in order to benefit from a cheaper fare. That we used to book a hotel room at about the same time, depart from home in our own cars to drive to the airport in order to check in at least an hour before departure, land an hour or two later depending on whether you're going to Durban or to Cape Town, then hire a car to go to your meeting and then retire at the hotel overnight. They will be surprised that we actually owned our own cars, that we owned holiday homes, etc. in the era of Uber, Lyft, Grab, Taxify, Airbnb, etc. You see, the last three weeks have demonstrated beyond any shadow of doubt that the technology like Zoom, like Google Hangouts, like Microsoft Teams, Skype, Blue Jeans, etc., is extremely effective and efficient, like we're doing tonight. COVID-19 has accelerated the digital economy, this thing that we call the fourth industrial revolution, 
or four IR. Remember, the first was water and steam. The second revolution was electricity. The third was driven by electronics and information, respectively. Just like the Johannesburg Secu Securities Exchange, or JSE for short, trading platform has now migrated from on the floor to online. So too has the education system migrated from bricks and mortar to an online business learning platform. You see, with the price of crude oil pegged to the US dollar, and now with the collapse of the crude oil, are we likely to see the emergence of a new currency? And with it, maybe the creation of a new trading block or even trading blocks. We read last week that China and Russia want to drop the dollar in favor of cryptocurrency. With the re-emergence of China and Russia forcefully in setting itself back onto the global agenda. Does this mean the displacement of the US of A, the biggest economy in the world for now, as a global police force and an honest arbiter of global conflicts? With the global lockdown, what about the incomplete project of globalization? One thing is certain, past assumptions are no longer accepted, like the stabilizing power of economic globalization job security, political liberalization, environmental protection, and technological innovation, all of these will have to be both reimagined and repurposed into creating a shared future in a fractured world by, amongst other things, driving sustained economic progress, by navigating both a multipolar and multi-conceptual world overcoming divisions in society and shaping the agile governance of technology. You see, we have always understood that we need to balance on the one hand, the medical imperative of trying to slow down the spread of COVID-19 with, on the other hand, the economic imperative of trying to keep our businesses running and maintaining sufficient levels of trade, of commerce and payments which are the lifeblood of economic activity and fundamentally change our own human behavior in recognizing and accepting our interdependencies and interconnectedness by demonstrating more gratitude, more care, more kindness, and continue to communicate with respect and understanding. Considering that to overcome the spread of COVID-19, we have already addressed the three pillars of physical distancing, self-quarantine, and working from home whilst observing good basic hygiene. The huge and deep structural inequality have been laid bare for all to witness. Some hurdles that are uniquely South African include practicing social distancing and preventative hygiene in a lived reality of the majority of our people who find themselves in crowded dwellings with no access to flush toilets, no access to piped water, no access to electronic communication, relying on public transport and the use of public health facilities. Many with already heightened health and socioeconomic vulnerabilities where many more face hunger, poor health, have pre-existing health conditions, have no medical aid, no insurance, have previously failed to find healthcare and find it difficult to save. In trying to effect the required working from home, just 10.4% of households have direct access to the internet, according to Stats SA. With our public transport not yet safe, accessible, and affordable, anyone getting into a taxi with a laptop and a smartphone is likely to have these confiscated. Even with these seemingly insurmountable challenges, I think President Matamela Selah Ramaphosa must be hugely congratulated for demonstrating uncommon leadership and bravery in declaring the urgently needed national lockdown in order to radically control the pandemic's contagion through draconian quarantine and now to continue on massive fiscal stimulus. I think we haven't seen everything Yet, what we are going to witness in the coming months 
it's definitely going to affect the economy as more and more of our people lose their jobs. Thank you very much, sir. I hope you can see the questions in the chat box because this is a conversation. Um, and I'd like you to read as many of those questions as possible and then answer them. In the event that you don't see them, we can tango and then I can also read some to you. I can see them when I'm on so some of them, but you know what? You being the effective and efficient moderator that you are, pose the ones that you think I must respond to. I think, all right. So the first question really comes from Wesley Harmanas. He's really wanting to find out how will the airline industry be shaped by the pandemic? Um, I think let's start with that one. I know you have already addressed it and hit it quickly. Wesley, the best way to think about that is there is no airline today that is profitable. <clears throat> Southwest Airlines, American Airlines, even Virgin Atlantic, at the beginning of this year, were posting record profits for the first quarter. Now Virgin Airlines, Southwest Airlines, and American Airlines are appealing to the American government to bail them out. In the case of Virgin Airlines alone, they're looking for 500 million euros. Otherwise, they're going to become bankrupt. In fact, Sir Richard Branson has started selling family jewels to make sure that um, they can at least cope. Here at home, um, I've already spoken about the three major ones, but even the ones that are flying to us on transcontinental, um, like Emirates, like Qatar, um, like British Airways, you can see that they are really constrained. For instance, domestic airlines in the US of A, Boeing 747, 400, 384 passengers, 38 crew members rounded off to 400. They are flying with around 23 passengers. We saw on YouTube how one family, one family occupied the entire airline um, and the entire airplane from one destination to the other. So, because remember, we stopped flying at the time that the World Health Organization declared this a, a pandemic of global interest. Here in our country, we were told to exercise only essential travel. When that happened, all of us stopped going to meetings uh, in, in person. I stopped going to, uh, uh, to Cape Town and I started having my meetings like I'm doing now with Zoom and indeed Microsoft Teams. So the, the, the beginning of the decline happened long before our announced 23 of March, effective 26 of March midnight, um, national lockdown, which was initially meant to last uh, 21 days and then to extend it by another two weeks uh, to an effective 35. Over to you, Ndatisi uh, I think that maybe let's take another question from Wesley again, uh, because this is a big one. Uh, how will the pandemic change employment agreements in general? So let's look at SAA, for instance. I mean, the pilots have an evergreen a contract where they get paid, pegged in and denominated in US dollars. They've got a good life, maybe a week, um, fly in and then a week of rest. The, the fact of the matter is now SAA has been put into business rescue. Those agreements mean nothing. They're absolutely null and void. The business rescue practitioners wanted to retain every single solitary one of the 4,700 employees. This excludes Mengu, it excludes South African Express Airways, it excludes South African Airways Tech. If you include those, that's north of 11,000 employees. So I think under these circumstances, when I said COVID-19 has changed everything, it also changes the employment contracts. Most of the people that worked the whole of uh, April at least were paid. Those that worked from home, uh, at least they were paid. Those that were asked not to come to work, not all of them were, get, were paid. Now that April is gone, those that are still working from home because we're level five, we are now on level four, and maybe 25, no more than 30% of the employer's workforce need to go back 
not at the same time, the chances are a lot of people are not going to get, get paid, even though you've got a contract, because these are extraordinary circumstances demanding extraordinary solutions. But of course, the Labor Relations Act is still in place, but if you are an employer, I spoke about the two uh, publishing houses that have been established for years that have now just simply died. Sechaba, back to you, sir. Thank you. I'm going to ask you two questions. One is from Guest 2020. The other one is from Trifina. The first one is uh, from Guest 2020. It says, the number of companies forced to close due to lack of cash flow amongst medium to large size businesses is a major concern. To what extent will this require new regulations with regard to cash preservation or liquidity ratio in place similar to the banking regulations? How will COVID-19 affect the regulatory landscape and how business and government interact and collaborate for a common objective? Trafina says, thank you very much in Tatebonang. My question is, when do you foresee our economy back at level one? As I can imagine that the economy can't survive in an extended lockdown as many are losing jobs and many companies are shutting down. You can take those two. So guess 2020, in terms of cash flow, I agree entirely with you. You know, any company that can survive this novel coronavirus has already made a profit. Not many companies are coming back. So if you can survive, you're okay. If you come back, then you will be able to make money later on until it comes out of your ears, whilst we wait not for another 100 years, for another pandemic to come back, because you can see they're coming closer and closer and they're becoming much more virulent. So what companies are going to do now, they realize what they've learned in Economics 101, that cash is key. You must preserve the cash. You don't do acquisitions. You just want to make sure that tomorrow you'll still be alive. New regulations will have to take into account the fact that there are major disruptions like H1N1 or the bad flu that happened mostly in Southeast Asia. In fact, when we heard on the 31st of December about Wuhan being closed, we said, ah, it's happened in Wuhan. We went on with our life intact. Not once did we say, Yo, if it's Wuhan, maybe it's coming to us. Let's start planning now in December because if we did, we would not have been caught with our eyes closed on the 5th of March when those 10 tourists landed on the 3rd of March and we were gifted with our very first patient. So rules like Sorbens Oxley, IFRS, especially IFRS 16, of course, will still have to comply with them. But I think anybody that does not take into account the fact that COVID-19 has changed everything, they're living in cloud cuckoo land. I'm hoping that's helpful, Guest 22. Matt Rafina, thank you for the warm words of encouragement as always, it's genuinely appreciated. When do I anticipate we'll get to level one? So when you read the risk-adjusted strategy, it says level five, maybe for another four weeks, then level four, maybe another four weeks, then three, then two, then one. In fact, tourism employs more people than mining. They are currently in level two, not in level four. That's why you can fly anywhere. Interprovincial uh, travel has not been allowed except when you come to work and once only, and then they uh, revise that to, to just seven days. I anticipate that the hotels, the restaurants, the guest houses, um, the BNBs, um, all of them are lobbying the current government as we speak to see whether they can be brought to level four if not at least to level three, because without tourism, I think, and without travel, and without business travel, I think we'll be in a spot of bother because tourism currently represents 9.8%, let's say 10% of the GDP. Without it, I don't think that stimulatory effect is going to happen. So when do I think level one is going to, uh, we're going to get there? My guess is that this government is going to realize that COVID-19 has already killed more than 10,000 people in just two weeks. I think um, starvation and hunger and the stubbornly high levels of unemployment that then lead to increasing levels of poverty and increasing levels of inequality, we 
is going to kill 10 times more in the shortest period of time. And it will be almost impossible uh, to recover. So I guess that the anticipated level one, which we're expecting maybe after the peak, which is expected in September, might actually come close, closer with stringent um, health protocols, washing your hands regularly, observing social distancing, and making sure that um, we continue to work from home. I think this is the new normal. I'm back to you, Muhul Anwak. Okay, I'm going to ask you three questions. I think Galaxy 6 has asked about mm-hmm. when do you see the tourism industry going to recover, according to you. I think you have addressed that. Uh, the next question from Nkurele Akosta is, what will Professor Ntatebo Nang advise to someone who is starting a new business during this uh, COVID-19 era? Wesley again asks, COVID-induced 4IR reality, will this change physical social interacting? Is that good or bad? And I think you also address that. And then the next one from Omartha says, what do you consider to be the immediate impact of COVID-19 on the retail sector and how will this be addressed? Uh, thank you. Yes, you can take those. So on startups, <clears throat> my only words of advice is, remember that when the first national bank, in fact, the first group which owns first national bank, it owns RMB, it owns West Bank, amongst others, was started. It was during periods of social turmoil. That's the time that entrepreneurship thrives. When Investec was founded, when a global recession, when Dubai was building, in the middle of that, when they were building the tallest building in the world, the Burj Al Arab is now called the Burj Khalifa. The 2008-2009 global recession had hit together with its contention. So if you are brave and you are patient and you are not looking for immediate returns, this is probably the best time to start a new company, but even better. In fact, if you have a bit of cash, a company that was valued at 100 rand before COVID-19, you'll probably buy for about 20 rand after COVID-19 because its net asset value would have been decimated. That's what wise people with money uh, want to do, but not many of us walk around uh, with spare cash. I'm hoping that helps. On social uh, interactions, look, there's nothing more painful than to have a funeral at home, a lalin, a car in the rural areas. And then people come and you say, I'm going to limit to 50. Which 50 goes in, which 50 doesn't? Seeing your old lost uncle coming to come and pay his respects and the only thing that they do is to hug you and on his shoulder you cry your heart out and now you have to wave at him the Wuhan wave or to extend a right elbow because you coughed into your left elbow. I mean, it's painful, but that's the new norm. This is the new reality. I love hugging people. Everybody that has ever worked with me will know. I get into the office, I kiss every single soul two and three times on each of their cheeks. That's finished, my friend, ain't coming back. Now I will wave. So social distancing has changed, I think up until the end of the year. In fact, if we are prudent, I think we, we're going to stop hugging and continue uh, with these measures. Lastly, what is it going to do to retail? I think some retail companies are already suffering because even if though a lot of them were open, they were not allowed to sell, to sell certain things. They can't sell liquor, they can't sell cigarettes, uh, for instance, so their revenue uh, is declining. On top of that, they are spending more money to get ready. So first they had to fumigate to make sure that they've killed the little virus or contamination that is there. Secondly, they now need to appoint a health officer. Number three, they now have to observe social distancing. You can't have 50 people come in. There's a distance of a trolley between uh, all of you. Some of them let 10, 30 people and they close the doors and so it is. So it's slow, it's painful, but we have prioritized life when in essence what we wanted to do is to prioritize both life and livelihoods. 
health as well as business. It's not either or, it's both and together at the same time, concurrently, simultaneously, and in parallel. Uh, the smaller uh, operators, I think, are going to bleed. You see checkers um, and pick and pay getting not only into the townships with big shopping malls, now they're getting into spaza shops and they're saying, let's give you a franchise of a shop right. Uh, in your own spaza shop, in your own container, you can use our procurement muscle of buying things uh, slightly cheap. I think it has changed everything. Then you have killed the ordinary shopkeepers, uh, the small retail shop that used to go, the bush away used to stand behind the counter and say, give me that thigh, cut it in so many thick pieces. I think it's going to be mass production when all of them start ordering from the central warehouses of checkers and indeed of pick and pay, even for spaza shops. I'm back to you, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, we've got six, 27 questions. I'm going to ask you to be as succinct and as brief as possible so that we can take as many of them as possible. Let me uh, get out of this environment and take you on the EmpowerWorks live uh, streaming where uh, True Men is asking, what will you propose consulting firms and academics and training service providers uh, and institutions do during this uh, lockdown period? And at the same time, we've got Kenneth who is asking, is interested in your discussions and gives you a compliment. His question is, are people working in the public sector safe? How is uh, se public sector uh, public impacted? In other words, just if you happen to be in an environment where you have to be meeting people and have, don't have the opportunity to, to social distance. If you can just take those ones from the live feed that is from EmpowerWorks uh, digital platform. So I'll be brief. Consulting firms, they must build not only their sustainability, but their resilience. They must find new ways of helping their clients. It can't just be you are a marketing research company, you do only market research, you might look maybe at general consulting. When you're in general consulting, you say, you know what, maybe what I'm going to do, I'm just going to focus on executive search, not just general recruitment. You have to do that. Secondly, on public sector safety, I think every company, you're as good as the leadership. We know that the private sector is slightly more effective and efficient. They're like a speedboat. They turn and respond very quickly. Government, on the other hand, is like a big juggernaut in the middle of the ocean, they take long to turn. But they've demonstrated beyond any shadow of doubt with COVID-19, Minister of Health, Dr. Zuelini Mkiz and the President, I don't think they are sleeping. Uh, you can see they've been nimble, they've been agile. So I, I think all of us are requested to, uh, to, to, to make sure that our people are safe. And that they're back to you, Stan. There is a question from Asanda that talks to what do you think the future of oil refinery firms will be given the advent of technology and so on, on the impact of technology, I guess. And then Umudise says, uh, what is your take on the future of the SOEs and which SOEs will you recommend for shutting down post-COVID-19? And Umzolisi says, COVID-19 has revealed South Africa's dependence on other countries for their for their day-to-day -day necessities. Do you think we are likely to see more localization of production past this pandemic? Thank you very much. On the refineries, our refineries today compare very well with the Southeastern Asian refineries, on average 50 years. But the future is not on liquid fuels or crude. The future is on integrated energy, which includes renewables, solar, wind, power, and hydro. That's where the future is because hydrocarbons are the thing of the past purely because of environmental concerns. Umudise on SOEs, we have more than 740 SOEs. In governments that are well run, these are a good source of wealth and source of employment and skills. Even in apartheid, most artisans, fitters and tenors and boilers and electricians were trained by Transnet. Since we came, we used these as looting machines. We don't need an SAA. 
it's a novelty project. It's a vain project for the middle class and the people who have got money. If you let SAA to collapse, other airlines will fill that space. We don't need to own our own SAA. Had we sold it for one rent, we'd have saved ourselves 20 billion of the bailouts. But we know that we could have sold it to Emirates when they wanted to buy it. The old administration that practiced state capture said no, because they thought their time to eat was going to be curtailed. So all those SOEs can be sold as far as I'm concerned. But a good example was Telcom, for instance. It was going against the wall at great speed when uh, Dina Pule was the Minister of Communications. And then a new board was put in place. The CEO was Thomas okay, The chairman was Dr. Jabulani uh, Albert Mabuza. And they turned it around. Within a year, they quadrupled their share price. But remember, they used to own Vodacom. And they sold it because they were bankrupt. And then they used the money that they got to start their own cellular company called Eta, which also almost died. So you can see that we are beginning not only to take the golden eggs, but to kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. We are now selling family jewels. Lastly, uh, Zolisi is saying we are totally dependent on other countries. I mean, that's true. To give an example, everything that we now import, we depend on logistics. Most of them come from China, including the ANC T-shirts, by the way, that has the president's face. Um, uh, on, on the front. They are imported from China. Why? I don't know. When we used to have a vibrant textile industry, especially around the Western Cape, is it going to accelerate localization? It must. If we don't, then we're foolish. Japan has 128 million people. China, 1.4 billion people. But Japan colonized China and most of Southeast Asia in the past. In fact, Japan today has 20 million Japanese working in China. They've just paid 2 trillion US dollars to Japanese companies to say, move your operations from America, bring them back home to make sure that they reduce this dependency and they build their localization for the next 100 years. We are still dependent on PPEs come from uh, philanthropists uh, coming through China Air and Cuba and etc. You can see we are not thinking strategically about this. It was President Tabombeki who said, if we don't think for ourselves, we place our future in the hands of others. It is up to us to create our own new world. Ntate Mutsielwa, I'm back to you. Let's just take a nice feel one uh, from Wesley who has asked before to say, if government showed now that they can be more socially responsible, how will how will this uh, be sustained beyond this period? So when you say government to be socially responsible, it's like oxymoron, the contradiction in terms. It's like saying a ministry of intelligence. We sow it with the food parcels. This is the biggest tragedy we've been confronted with. When you give it to councillors and public officials, they get 100 parcels, they distribute at the most 50 if you are lucky. They keep 50 for their friends and families. And they keep another 50 to sell to Spaza shop and to also shops that are owned by Pakistanis and others. And that is the government that we have at the moment. Until and unless we build systems and processes in place that says, if you bribe, you steal and cheat, you go to prison, this will continue. For 10 years, we've been talking about state capture. Richard Quest reminds us at the World Economic Forum at the beginning of January this year, 10 years later, not one person is wearing orange overalls at the other Sun City. Until and unless we send a message that says there are consequences. And when you do something uh, that is against the law, will go after you like our whole life depends on it, will throw you in and, and throw away the keys, the people will continue. When President Sri Ramaphosa came in, we had a lot of hope. 30 ministers were thieves. He fired 10, but he kept 20. They are still in his cabinet as we speak. And in fact, they get promoted. Most of them are chairpersons of portfolio committees in parliament. Bom Sebenzi Zwani, Pansipale Parliament D. 
Over to you, Dr. Mutsiri. I just want to acknowledge Abel Mutoho's question. Um, I wish I could understand a lot of the stuff that he has asked. I'm going to try and read it so that when I come back, I will be able to, uh, to read it properly because at the moment, I'm still struggling to, to get it. So let me move to Samson while I'm still figuring out how the question is freed from Abel. Given the current challenges, what will you say is the role of uh, the professionals, Black in particular? This in light of SAA being handed to a rescue team who were mandated to turn it around, they rather are winding it down. Then the next one, which comes from O Hatutselo, said, how is the pandemic going to affect the future of the church? And then V Primal says, COVID-19 has brought about significant disruptions to the entire economy forcing businesses to introspect and uh, repurpose. Uh, What's the future of education likely to to look like? If you can take those, uh, Professor Mohan. So Samson's role of professionals, you know, there is no institution, or let me put it differently and say, no people can be helped by or benefit from institutions that are not the direct result of their own character. Until and unless the 740 SOEs, we repurpose them, fashion them, and shape them in our own image. We must forget about Black economic empowerment and having all 740 having Black CEOs who are professional, effective, and efficient, who are not cadre employees. Business rescue practitioners, their job is simple. Have a look at this thing. Look at the solvency and liquidity and anticipated investments in the following year. And if assets still exceed their abilities, maybe it can be saved. But in the case of SAA, it was hopeless. And the only solution was sell it. It's the right solution, by the way. The one that says, but let's form another new SAA. That's politics speaking. Where will you get the money at the time when you're technically bankrupt? We announced a 500 billion rent economic stimulus package. A lot of it we're still going to borrow from the World Bank and the IMF. So this government is technically bankrupt. We don't have money. So these vanity projects, I think we should forget about them and worry about eliminating pit latrine toilets why youngsters are still dying uh, and falling sad, tragic, and regrettable deaths. Uha Tutselo, the future of the church. I think the days of going to Moria with 6 million people are gone, my friend. They are not coming back. And if you do, you're putting your own life at risk. So I think we might have to contend with doing your church with your pastor by Zoom or Skype. Um, that's the future of tomorrow. And if you do, it will be 15 small groups of 10. The big tents where you used to have 3,000 people, unless you are suicidal, I'm not going there with you. Uh, Primal says, what is the future of education? You know, 10 years ago, we said, but why are you worrying about Limpopo not being able to deliver textbooks uh, to the schools when SAB delivers twice a week to twice as many shibins as there are schools in this country. Why don't you just part, partner with them? We ask the question, but in fact, why are you giving them books when you can give every single soul to one of the learners a laptop, an iPad, where you can load the whole syllabus for the whole 12 years of education and all the books, and they don't have to break their backs carrying these heavy books. So the future is going to be online. Bricks and mortar are going to be less. We are going to do more lectures because a single professor, instead of talking to a class of 100, that professor, in the same time, can talk to 200,000 students in 197 countries and locations. Over to you, Ntatum Sia. Uh, FIFA from uh, our online is asking, how will you advise SMEs to develop their strategy for sustainability? And then Kubulani says, how do we infuse a sense of pragmatism in government instead of ideological uh, posturing? 
And the next one from Sianda outside says, thank you very much for the comprehensive update of the state of our economy. What is your view of getting into the pharmaceutical space that has, uh, that has our own wing of research and local manufacturing? I guess it also talks to the need to not be dependent on the external environment. If you can just take those. Uh, we have 10 more minutes left after I take those, and then I'll see how many of the questions we can still take. Development of a strategy for startups and SMEs, <clears throat> I think find a gap, a product or service that the world needs, then you'll be able to name your price. Think, reflect, uh, you'll be amazed. Uh, innovation, it's about finding solutions to today's problems, about pragmatism of government. You know, they're in a tripartite alliance with Labour and the South African Communist Party. Three things that don't belong together is like water and oil. Remember Marikana and Lonmen? <clears throat> they demanded 16,800. The only way you can get 16,800 per employee is if you have the number of employees or you close down uh, the business. And today there is no loanman. When SAA said we don't have money, therefore we propose zero salary increase, NUMSA went on strike and thereby accelerated the demise of SAA. If the bankruptcy was going to take nine months, it happened in three weeks. That's what we saw at ESCO. Paraman had ever said zero increases for this year. The Minister of Public Enterprise says, no, 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 you can't negotiate like that. You have to put something on the table, thereby throwing the CEO under the bus. Not only that, but the whole board under the bus. Where in the world have you ever seen unions negotiating with the minister? Negotiations for salary increases and retrenchments are always done with the executives, not with the board. Because if you do with the minister, you undermine the board. In fact, the unions will now say, we know how to, go to talk to God directly. Why do we need the board? Why do you need management? So you can see that there is lack of this thing called role clarity and definition. What is the role of the shareholder? What is the role of the board? So that you can say, what is the role of the executives? Government moves from the one to the other at will because they're interested in votes, not in good cooperative governance. They are not interested in stewardship and probity, in the duty of care, skill and diligence but most importantly, the duty of faith on pharmaceuticals. We had pharmaceuticals like Lennon's out in the Eastern Cape, I think it's PE or East London, that used to manufacture here. Now it's called Aspen because it's bigger. It's not much more global. But unfortunately, the raw material you need still comes from China. We manufacture kettles here of Russell Hobbs. But the element that heats the water comes from China. So until we wake up and smell the coffee and say localized, by the way, our economic vision is the NDP 2030. And then we developed another one called the New Growth Path when Minister Ibrahim Patel was still looking after EDD, premised on four things. One, it was about re-industrialization. It was about beneficiation. It was about localization and the creation of black industries. We spoke about it. We have done nothing about it. How many black industrialists do you know? We issued new casino licenses. All the licenses were in the former homelands, but the new ones that we gave, we don't see many black people walking around as billionaires. We gave to the usual suspects. Over to you, Ndatemusia. This one talks from uh, Lebohang. It says, how can we better prepare young people in general and students in particular for life beyond covert 19, what are the red flags and opportunities? And ooh, that came from Lohang. Khotatselo says, is the demand for student accommodation still relevant as a strategy or you're going to need to change that given uh, how things are going to be? Um, then there's one around, um, uh, my paper talks about the recent government legs to promote local manufacturing and prevent import? Could it be around the currency? Um, the whole question around why we still rely so much on exporting, that general feeling is coming through from the other conversations around why don't we um, uh, localize and look using things um, 
that we have, and I think you have addressed that. A random one that I didn't see this one coming talks to, for example, how do we use the SABC as a medium of education, um, you know, not just uh, for entertainment, given the agency and its uh, uh, footprint. And then there's a question around the peak, whether it has flattened or not, but really uh, saying, how do we progress through these levels given the unpredictability of, uh, of the peak? That is from Bumi, I paraphrase there. Yeah, and uh, this question around um, resourcing around how do we make sure that beneficiation really becomes entrenched? Dr. Musiala, thank you very much. So let me be brief in the instance of time. You see, as youth are concerned, 60% of 58.78 million South Africans are people of 35 years and younger. Therefore, the youth are not the future leaders, they are the current leaders. The only way to learn to swim, you can't learn it from reading a book. You need to put your deep toe into the water at some stage. So we must trust young people, we must give them responsibilities. I was never born as an MD. Somebody trusted me in my 20s and made me the MD of the world's biggest and oldest elevator company, Otis. I was MD of Otis 1996, just two years into democracy. Kutatse, no, student accommodation. You know, when we say the future will move away from bricks and mortar to online, it takes a long time. We said with online reading and um, a digital media that the newspapers are going to be irrelevant. Uh, but people are still printing newspapers until you saw um, on the 1st of May, Associated Press died, uh, and then uh, Kexton died. In fact, in the US of A, they are asking government, the government is asking business to say, please invest in, in advertising in the media because our media is dying. So it takes a long time. There will still be a need for accommodation, but don't build a cultural center for students thinking you'll get rental for the next 50 years. I mean, look at UNISA, distance learning, is probably the biggest university in Africa. 1.3 billion people, um, 50 countries, 2,000 languages. Um, and, and on my paperless question on currency um, and depending on exporting, you see our problem is structural. Round up the, the figures, the 60 million South Africans. In the US of A, there's 300 million so they can afford to be arrogant and just sell only to the US of A. And the majority of those people have capacity to pay. Now in South Africa, 60 million, only 16 million are gainfully employed, 18 million are on social security, 10 million young people are not in employment, education, or training. So you can see that our math doesn't add up. That's why we need to export because we don't have enough market. But we need to talk about regional integration because in Africa, like I said, there's 1.3 billion people, the same population as in India. But in Africa, you have to deal with 50 legislations, 50 countries, 50 borders, whereas in India, it's one government, probably two religions, Islam or, or Hindu, and most of them will understand a little bit of English. Africa is Francophone, it's Anglophone, and God knows what else? SABC, you see, our politicians don't know the difference between what is government, what is party. Now they don't know the difference between what is a state broadcaster and a public broadcaster. And they're trying to turn the SAB into a state broadcaster for their own propaganda. Public broadcaster says it's paid for by government through taxes like the CNN, which is private, uh, but the British one, um, which is owned wholly by government, but is in the interest of South Africa Inc., not of the political party. I think that's what uh, we need to look at. The peak is estimated to be around uh, September. In the meantime, what can we do to make sure that we prepare? I think is the lockdowns allow business to open, but with very strict uh, health protocols to make sure that we don't kill uh, the majority of our people. I think a lot of us are still going to be infected. A lot of us are still going to die. But the choice of whether you die or not, it's personal. 
It's not government. It's not Minister of Health. It's how you behave on beneficiation. I think we are fools. We used to be the world's biggest producer of gold, a thousand tons of gold per annum. Now we are not even in the top 10, 160 um, tons. In fact, Anglo-American was born here. But today there's not a signal of the big gold producing countries that are still here. All of them have now sold because of our lack of regulatory certainty and policy stability. Over to you, Dr. Mitsir. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. There are so many questions that uh, were there, but we have run out of time. And I just want one word for you before I thank you around people in the rural areas and in the poor to say, what words of hope can you give them given the digital divide and just how underserviced they, they are. And as you are speaking, I will uh, sign you out. So 60% of South Africa is in urban areas. Agriculture is not sexy anymore. So is farming. And yet that's where jobs can be created in large numbers. You don't need metric to be a farmer. You don't need metric to be a farm worker. And if you are treated with dignity and respect, you can absolutely be able to feed your own people. And if you do so, then you start exporting, you earn much needed foreign currency. We have stopped seeing farming as sexy, and that's where I think our salvation is going to come from. Tourism, every single solitude one of our young people educated, they should be in open buses and uh, talking to tourism. You pay them nothing, they make their money from tips like they do in Canada. Lastly, I think we need to continue to think because the minute we stop thinking, we place our future in the hands of others. It's been an absolute privilege talking to all of you. And I thank you for finding time in your busy schedule to come and listen to my mad rant. I'm absolutely humbled beyond words. Thank you very much, sir. I think in the words of Biani Zwani says, will you agree that effective leadership is more necessary now more than pure management to point the way out of a crisis and to the actual delivery of what's needed uh, on the ground. I thank you very much for your wisdom, uh, Professor Bonamo Hali, as well as your insight. You are listening to the Empowerx uh, Entrepreneur Digital com uh, Conversation under the hashtag Empower Entrepreneurs. Professor Bonamo Hali is the Chancellor of the University of the Free State, Professor of the practice in the Johannesburg School of Business, College and Business and Economics, and chairman of the Bidvest Group Limited. He is the author of the best selling book, Lift As You Rise. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye.